Hi everyone, my name is John Vandermeer. I'm a professor in the school in the uh, <laughs> professor in ecology and evolutionary biology, with also a courtesy appointment of the School of Natural Resources, and also a professor in the program in the environment. And I'm here to introduce my good friend Mark Wilson. I've known Mark Wilson since the Pleistocene, I believe, and uh, <clears throat> uh, ever since he was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. Before he went on to Harvard to get his uh, to get his PhD, he and I were in an or organization called Science for the People, which uh, originated back in the '60s, those days when people talked about politics a lot. And uh, it's an organization that still exists today. If anybody's interested, you can ask me about it afterwards. Uh, Mark is a professor in, this, in the Department of Ent uh, Epidemiology in the School of Public Health. He also has a, um, has a dry appointment in, a courtesy appointment in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and LSNA. His favorite food, he says, is tofu and salad, although he did admit to me he likes the tofu when it's fried nice and crispy. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, it was the place to see, but you're still older than I am. <laughs> um, so what I want to do today is really different than um, what's been done so far, in that infectious disease is the outcome that I'm primarily interested in. But by way of background, just as a reminder, most of you know that in high-income countries, it's not infectious diseases that kills most people or that causes most uh, uh, ill health. In Underdeveloped, low-income countries, uh, that's the situation, however, and that's really where I want to focus my concern. So I start with, here on the left, agricultural expansion or uh, development in various ways and infectious diseases on the right. And so what's the relationship between the two is really where I'm headed. And want to um, suggest that changes in agricultural practices will impact on pathogenic microbe transmission. And we want to know more about the interactions of uh, with other components of human uh, well-being and understand more about the knowledge that's needed to design and implement programs that will um, make changes. So we've got this uh, simple relationship here, right, where food availability impacts on nutrition, which in turn should reduce infectious diseases. But at the same time, uh, we have other pathways that also should be reducing infectious diseases. So. The world is good, right? We've got now agricultural productivity increasing and reducing infectious diseases. Suppose, however, that we have cash crops entering into the scene, in which case you might actually then reduce the food availability, which in turn then would reduce, would, would in, increase rather, uh, infectious diseases. And there are a number of examples of that that I won't go into right now. Let's suppose as well that changes including the development of dams, irrigation related to food production, uh, deforestation, clearing land to do so, um, and crop or animal concentration uh, would, would be part of that scenario, uh, which then in turn could increase vector and waterborne diseases, uh, contact with uh, animal animal microbes and other uh, exposures, which then, of course, would increase infectious diseases. So, a couple of quick examples. The Senegal River Diama Dam uh, was planned in the 1980s. I was actually, I had the good fortune to be part of a, a series of studies that dealt with this. Um, and a number of changes took place. People moved into the area. Rift Valley fever, malaria, and schistosomiasis were anticipated by a USAID report. Uh, and lo and behold, the, these diseases uh, occurred with outbreaks that killed many thousands of animals and hundreds of people. Malaria and schistosomiasis continue today. Deforestation and uh, maize production in uh, the Llanos of Venezuela is another example. Um, they clear-cut the Llanos, uh, parts of it in, uh, in and around Guanarito, uh, to develop crop production. Uh, including beef in particular, and as a result, uh, dispersed farmhouses developed, uh, animals, including rodents, were disrupted, but then they in turn became more abundant, inf in invaded people's houses, and Guanarito virus was discovered, Venezuelan hemorrhagic fever resulted. Plenty of other examples that I won't be able to go into right now, all of them agriculture related, resulting in increased infectious diseases. 
So we have this scenario then in which we might also be able to think of the ability to work being decreased by infectious diseases. And similarly, we have perhaps anemia developing from infectious diseases, micronutrient and other inadequacies resulting, and this then would reduce the ability to work, which would in turn uh, increase infectious diseases. <coughs> so this simple solution here to agriculture impacting on infectious diseases actually has a very different scenario if you put it in the context of the larger whole. So we have these multiple levels of uh, disease risk that we can think of, and each of them contribute to the agroecological drivers that we need to be concerned about. So we're faced then with the challenge of how do we plan and implement enhanced food production and at the same time uh, sustainably uh, develop long-term goals in the short-term sense that we've uh, been thinking about it. So we're faced with a need for multi-sectorial and, and cross-disciplinary studies, but we're not trained to do this. We need multi-level analyses, uh, but we're not really uh, conceptually or analytically well equipped. We need to design projects that consider impacts that are multiple levels and the cost uh, that we use, the cost benefit metric that we use is often not considering these. We want to develop prediction capacity but these com complex drivers aren't, aren't easily uh, addressed. And finally we want to reduce risk and improve health but many of our solutions aren't available to us today. Thank you.